to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. Today is Tuesday, January the 22nd, 2019. It's 8 a.m. in New York. It's 5 a.m. in Los Angeles. It's 1 p.m. in London, Sydney, Australia. You're at 12 midnight. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for tuning in for yet another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And Cindy Chavez is uh, still dealing with some personal stuff that uh, is getting in the way of her doing the morning podcast this week. So for this week, we're going to both today and tomorrow be doing some more reading from the book that we started last week that I introduced you to, Into the Magic Shop. Uh, This is a book that has a a presentation of Law of Attraction that I didn't really expect. It was uh, from a story written about... uh, uh, autobiographic biographically about uh, a boy in his early teens in 1968 in Lancaster, California, who was introduced to the law of attraction without it being called that by a woman he meets who is the o- mother of, a, of an owner of a magic shop where you can buy magic tricks. Really interesting, um, but a very, very fun presentation of it. So that's why I thought it was so, so interesting and so, um, so much fun to read here on the podcast. Um, and plus, with uh, there, there have been a number of um, co-host absences in the last week and a half or so, so you know, it's all kind of worked out well. That's the way the law of attraction works, doesn't it? It you know delivers everything just in the right time and right the right way that you need it. Boy, it just per- turned up perfectly for me to have this book so that I could be filling in some of these times, uh, sharing it with you, and uh, letting co-hosts take some time that they need to take. So uh, while we're uh, getting this going, I had a. We had, I should say, a comment from somebody who had listened to an episode that I did with, I think it was with, uh, I can't think, think who it was. It may have been with Patty Framo. It may have been with Linda Armstrong. Not sure who um, we did that, that show with. But anyway, he had asked a question that is an extremely common question, uh, but I promised I would address it on today's show. And if you'll give me just a moment, I'm just kind of still setting things up here so that I've got everything where I need it. Um, but uh, let me bring the question up here. I actually copied and pasted it where I could see it. it said, his name is Suman, and, he, and he's a student, I believe. And he says, could you please tell me how to manifest money when you don't have any money? And that's a perfectly understandable question because we usually think about, well, you have to have some money in order to make money and so forth. So how can you possibly uh, manifest money if you don't have money? Well, First of all, Suman, there are, uh, well, there are a few things I'd like to tell you about. Um, first one is, the, the direct answer to your question is, you have to feel good about money all the time. Uh, it's especially true with money, more so even than with other stuff, because money is the one where we trip up most often. It's the one where we allow ourselves to get frustrated and depressed and disappointed because it didn't show up when we wanted it to show up. It didn't come in the way we expected it to come. And it didn't show up in time or you know whatever it might be, or it didn't show up at all. Um, and it's because we have the most negative vibrations about money. That sounds kind of strange, perhaps. And if you're not familiar with the concept of vibration, that can also be confusing. But I just like to translate that in my head. Whenever I hear vibration, I just translate it to happiness level. The higher the vibration, the higher the happiness level. The lower the vibration the lower the happiness level or even the the greater amount of fear or anger or depression or whatever it might be. So understood that way, uh, in in order to attract money, you always have to have a really happy um, viewpoint and understanding and thought process where money is concerned, including those times where the money doesn't seem to be showing up. And that's why people trip up on it. I usually like to recommend if you're relatively new to being a deliberate creator, don't start with money. The reason is that's the one we have the most negative stuff built up about. And so there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot more to let go of. It can take some time because we are brought up in societies that help us build up lots and lots and lots of negativity about a variety of things, especially money, but about a variety of things. And it just can take some time for us to work through it. It's not because the universe is slow. It's not because source energy is slow. It's because we're slow. We just take time. We have we we need to take time in order to uh, work through things. Um, so that's why I recommend don't start with money. Start with uh, stuff that it's easier for you to believe um, you could manifest, and take advantage of the fact that when you are manifesting, you are manifesting anything. You are building up your belief 
in manifestation. You're building up your belief that, yes, I do have the ability to attract what I want into my life. And that's something that I found I've had to build slowly over the last, uh, let's, let's see, it's 11 and a half years now that I've been doing this, that I've been uh, learning to be a deliberate creator. And in the process, I have had to take small baby steps every step of the way, letting go a little bit of this and this and this and this, a lot of things I didn't even know I needed to let go of. I mean, that's actually probably the vast majority of things that came along. I didn't even know they were there, which is, you know, that makes it particularly hard, doesn't it, if you don't know that it's there. So that's why I say start with stuff that's easier, stuff that you can find it easier to believe. Um, if it's, it, it could be just manifesting little things in your life, manifest a cup of coffee, manifest a, you know, finding some money on the ground instead of finding, you know, having a million dollars come into your, uh, into your hands. How about just manifesting, finding, you know, pocket change around, manifest, finding new friends, manifest, um, finding a relationship, manifest, uh, improving some aspect of your health, manifest, uh, you're, you're a student, manifest getting into the class that you want to get into that you didn't think you could get into manifest stuff. That's much more easy to believe in. And once you do that for a period of time, how long, I can't tell you. It varies from one person to the next. But once you do that for a while, your belief starts to build up. And why is that? It's because of what Abraham describes as the momentum factor. The more that we focus on X, whatever X is, we tend to believe in X more and more over time. We just, just the focus on it helps us believe in it more and more over time. Neville Goddard talks about how when we focus on X on a regular basis, we harden it into reality. It starts as a thought, and then over time, the thought hardens into reality. So that's the way I like to think about it. Now, specifically where money is concerned, again, it comes down to what's your relationship with money. You say you have no money. So I imagine that your relationship with money is, well, I don't have any money. I'm so frustrated. I don't have any money. I can't buy anything. I don't, I, I mean, where, where's the money going to come from? I got to get some money somehow. All of those are positions of lack. They're all positions of, I don't have, I can't have. They're negative. They don't feel good. And because of that, that being your dominant thought pattern about money, you continue to not have money. Law of attraction. It's very, it's pretty obvious when I explain it that way, isn't it? I mean, it's pretty straightforward that when you don't have the money, well, of course, you know, you're going to continue to have a mindset that says, I don't have the money. And because money is such a huge part of what we have to deal with in life, I mean, you, you have to pay your rent or for your mortgage or whatever. You have to have money to buy food and for uh, having clothing and shelter and, you know, all, all the basics in life, plus money to do things like go to school or to, uh, you know, do other things that we want to do with our lives. So money plays a really big role. And because of that, it has so many different ways for us to go negative on it. And because there are so many different ways to go negative, that's why we have trouble attracting money. So how do you do it? You change all of your thought process around. You literally reverse all that momentum. And you can see that that's just going to take some time, isn't it? If you've had a, a long-standing habit of feeling like you don't have money and you can't have money and there's not enough money, that's not going to turn around right away. You, you, you're going to have to do some real mental exercise to convince yourself that you feel good about money, not that you feel bad about money, that you feel uh, money is coming in, that you're confident, that you believe in it, that you trust, that it's all going to be there. That's what you're trying to go for. So how do you attract money? You, you attract money by believing you're having money. You attract money by believing that money is there, that there's plenty of it. People do affirmations for that purpose. Affirmations are great. Uh, people meditate for that. Meditation is great. Um, people go out in nature to change their mindset to something happier so that they can feel better about attracting money. All that is great. Everything that you can do to get yourself into that higher vibration, that, that uh, higher happiness level, is going to make it easier for you to feel good about money. So what do you have to do? Do all of it. Do all of it. Um, and by the way, I don't know what your um, prospects are for employment in your area. Obviously, that's a primary way that people get money. Why not get a job? Now, if you don't have any prospects for a job, again, there's a mindset going on there. It's, there's also probably some reality going on. Uh, but the mindset is there first. Change that mindset and the job will appear. So, um, 
again, I don't know what you know what your circumstances are specifically. You're, it sounds like you're trying to work your way through school. I'm, I'm guessing. All I know is that you're a student, so I just kind of infer. <clears throat> but change your mindset about being able to get a job. Start believing I can get a job. I, there's, the job is going to appear. I don't necessarily have to know where the job is going to be or how it's going to come about. I just have to know it's going to appear. And then take some steps, too. It's a lot easier to get momentum going when you're taking physical action in congruence with feeling better about money, feeling better about getting a job and so forth. So when you combine the two together, when you get yourself into the best feeling place you can get into and keep yourself there on a regular basis and and make it about money too and about job and so forth, and at the same time take steps to go out and find a job, you'll find that everything starts to work better. You'll find that the job comes easier and you'll find that it'll come quicker. So it's all mindset. It's all what you're thinking about. And uh, that, I mean, that, that is about as easy an answer as you can get, isn't it? It's just mindset. Of course, just mindset, that's something that we all work to, to, uh, to change, to, to feel better about, to feel good about. And that, that's where the real work is done. So work on your mindset. And become a regular listener of LOA Today. Um, look for our schedule of events. Um, like our page at LOA Today on Facebook, and you'll be able to um, see the events that pop up there. You can also subscribe to the podcast through the links that are in the um, posts that you were looking at. Um, but <clears throat> whichever way you, you, you do it, make sure that you're listening to the episodes that we do twice daily, uh, Monday through Friday, plus once on Sunday. That's 11 episodes a month. And just keep following and keep listening and participating. And you will find that just getting your daily dose of happy will also help you get into that higher happiness, that higher vibrational place, um, what some call the higher consciousness. So thank you for the question. And uh, before we get going with the uh, reading, uh, I'm seeing a lot of people saying hello, people saying they agree, a lot of our regular listeners. Hi, Nasha. Hi, Didi. Hi, Siraj. Uh, Sarita. So hello, everybody. I don't see any questions going on. So without further ado, <clears throat> excuse me, without further ado, we're going to get back into the book. Inside the Magic Shop by James Doty, M.D. He is a uh, neurosurgeon, and he wrote this book um, a few years back, just a few years ago, about his experience when he was a youngster, a, a young teenager growing up in Lancaster, California, and he met uh, a man who ran a magic shop and his mother, and uh, the guy's mother taught this guy, James, about the law of attraction, although she didn't call it that. We've read uh, the first few chapters, first three chapters, actually, over the last two episodes. I'm going to pick up today, uh, I, I think we actually read a few pages of this, of this on, uh, when was it, Friday, Thursday, I can't remember when the last time was that we that we read, um, but the first few pages of chapter four, I, I think I read, but I'm going to start them again just because I want to start the chapter clean. So previously, um, he has been taught how to relax his body, which we would call meditation, and most recently, how to relax his mind, which we would call stealing those thoughts that just go off in all directions. Again, a meditation practice. And uh, we are now going to go on to the third step. She teaches a four-step process for attracting what you want into your life. And the third step, um, well, I, I don't want to give it away, uh, but basically it's feeling good, tapping into your feelings. So here we go. Chapter four, Growing Pains. I left earlier than usual for the magic shop because it is expected to be one of the hottest August days on record in Lancaster, triple digits. The sky was full of wispy clouds that looked more sooty than white. It wasn't sunny and it wasn't cloudy and everywhere you looked was either brown or gray. I could feel the heat coming up from the ground through the pedals on my bike, so hot I thought it would singe the hair on my legs. I had to alternate, one hand at a time, on the handlebars, so both hands didn't feel like they were burning, and I tried riding no-handed for a while down Avenue K, and was just getting up a good rhythm when I heard yelling from the field next to the Episcopal Church. I recognized the bigger kid, the one who was throwing the punches. He was two grades above me, and both my brother and I had been pushed around, hit a few times, and even spat on by him and his trusty sidekick. They were a gang of two and pretty much ruled Lancaster in the afternoon between the hours of three and five during the school year. 
Obviously, they were not op- they were operating on extended summer hours because here it was not even 10 a.m. and I could see one of them punching and kicking a kid while the other yelled and laughed. I couldn't see who it was because the kid on the ground was curled up and had his head down. His arms were wrapped around the top of his head, trying to protect it, and for a second, I thought it might be my brother, but then I remembered he had actually been at home when I left. Now, I'm not sure what it was that made me get off my bike and start yelling at the boys. I was used to defending my brother, a habit that I would carry on with me into adulthood, but I didn't go looking for fights, and certainly not with these guys. They didn't hear me at first, and as I walked toward them, it was like I could feel every punch and kick they delivered to the boy on the ground, and my heart started to hammer in my chest. I took a deep breath and yelled again for them to cut it out. Stop it! The big guy was hunched over the kid, and when he heard me, he stood up tall. He gave me a snarly grin and then kicked the kid on the ground one more time in the stomach. It made me flinch and feel like I had just been kicked in the stomach myself. Who's going to make me, he said. Their attention diverted to me, and I saw the kid on the ground roll onto his back and start to get up. It was a kid I kind of knew from school. I couldn't remember his name, but I knew his family had transferred here last last year. His dad was out at the airbase. The kid's face was bloody, and his glasses were in the dirt next to him. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> he had to be half the size of all three of us. I was as tall as these older kids, but they outweighed me by at least 30 pounds. And I watched as he got to his feet and started staggering toward the church. And I couldn't blame him for getting the heck out of there. You going to take his place? The head bully said. The two boys took a few steps toward me, and I felt my mouth go dry and my ears start to buzz. I tried to make I tried taking some deep breaths the way Ruth had taught me, but I couldn't seem to get the air to fill up my lungs. This was not going to be good. So, you think you're a hero? Some kind of freaking hero? I didn't say anything. I tried relaxing my legs and my hands like I had learned in the magic shop. I bounced up and down on the balls of my feet and cleared out my thoughts. If I had to fight, I would. I wasn't going to run. I'm going to kick your ass and then we're going to take your bike. I still didn't say anything. I sensed the sidekick moving behind me a little, but I just stared straight at the guy who liked to punch and kick. He was the one who called the shots for this pair. He moved his face so close to my face that I could see some sort of white gunk in the corner of his mouth. It was getting hotter by the second, and his face was sweaty and dirt-stained. Unless you want to kiss my feet, he taunted. I thought of Ruth and Neil in the, in the magic shop. They would be waiting for me to ride up right about now. Would Ruth think I had skipped a day with her when I didn't show up? Would anyone find me out here bleeding? Did the other kid go to get help? Did this guy wake up, have his cereal and milk, and just run out of the house ready to beat people up with all, without even wiping his mouth? All these thoughts started racing through my mind, but I just stared at the dried white gunk and pretended it was the light of a candle. Kiss my feet! I looked up and into his eyes and spoke for the first time since I had told him to stop beating the other kid. No. He reached out and grabbed the front of my t-shirt. Kiss my feet, he threatened. His mouth began to make a smile like someone who knows he has power over another. His face got right up to mine and I could smell and feel his breath. I closed my eyes for a second and in that second, something was different. I opened my eyes and looked directly into his. I stared deep into his eyes, the way we do when we're trying to really understand something or someone. You can do anything you want to me, but I'm not kissing your feet. He laughed and looked to the side at his friend. I saw him raise his eyebrows, and then he looked back at me. I stared at him without blinking. He lifted his fist and cocked it behind his ear, but I didn't flinch. I just kept my eyes locked on his, and in that moment, I didn't care that he was bigger than me or that there was some other kid's blood on his fist. I wasn't going to back down. I wasn't going to give him the power to make me afraid. And I wasn't going to kiss his feet or anyone's feet, ever. And for a second, our eyes locked together. And I saw him. And he knew I saw him. I saw his own pain and fear, a pain and fear that he tried to hide with his bullying. His gaze broke from mine, and he looked at his sidekick and back at me. What a waste. He let go of my shirt and pushed me a little so that I stumbled back a step, but I didn't fall. He didn't look at me again for the briefest of moments and turned away. It's too hot. Let's get out of here. I felt the other kid give a little push against my back, but it was more for show than anything else. 
I could tell he wasn't sure what had just happened. They both started walking away, and I could see the other boy talking to the bully. I knew he was asking why he didn't beat me up. The bully pushed him and said, shut up, and neither of them looked back. I took a few more deep breaths and watched them as they walked away before I turned toward my bike. I wasn't exactly sure what happened or even why I did what I did, but it felt good, and suddenly I realized I was late and Ruth was waiting for me. I hoped she didn't think I had just blown her off, so I got on my bike and raced as fast as I could to the magic shop. I went bursting through the door out of breath, but ready to tell Ruth and Neil the whole story of what had happened on my way to the shop. I had stood up for myself and had stood up for a little kid who couldn't defend himself. For probably the first time, I felt like a hero. Ruth had to forgive me for being late when she realized what I had done. Ruth, I called out. It was strange. Neither she nor Neil were at the counter. Ruth! Neil! I'm here! Nothing. I headed back toward the office, and that's when I heard their voices. Ruth and Neil were arguing. I had never heard them argue. He's just a boy. He's going to remember this for the rest of his life. You have to make it right. It's too late. The damage has been done. I'll explain it all to him when he's older. Damage can and should be undone, Ruth sounded angry. I had never heard her sound like that, and it worried me. Had I done something wrong? Were they that mad about me being late? None of it made any sense. What damage had Neil done to me? What was he going to explain to me when I was older? Neil, everyone makes mistakes. I certainly made my share with you. But I'm telling you, it's not too late to fix this. You'll regret it if you don't. Trust me. Everything got quiet. I didn't want them to walk out and see me eavesdropping. I walked back to the front of the shop and opened the door again and called out their names. Maybe they wouldn't know I had overheard them. Hello, I called out. Ruth, I'm here. Ruth walked through the office door. Her eyes were red like my mom's, so I knew she'd been crying. Jim, she said, you're late. I'm sorry, I had a little problem on my way here. Ruth looked me up and down. Is that blood on your shirt? Yes, I answered, but it's not mine, don't worry. Ruth laughed. That worries me even more. Come on back. I walked past Neil, and he mumbled hello, but didn't look at me. I wasn't sure what I had done or what he had done, but it must have been bad. It seemed like he hated me now. Ruth had me sit down in the chair and walk me through the relaxation exercise, and then asked me to chant my mantra in my head. I started, but I couldn't stop replaying the conversation I had heard. What mistake had Neil made with me? What was so bad that Ruth would be crying? I couldn't take it anymore, and I certainly couldn't tame my thoughts right now. So I said, what happened? What did I do? Why is Neil mad at me? I blurted out all three questions with my eyes still closed, and then I opened them to see Ruth looking at me with a puzzled look. Why would you think you did something, she asked. I heard you and Neil arguing about me. I heard you through the door. He hates me. Ruth continued to stare at me, and then she just nodded her head. You heard all that? Yes, I said miserably. I knew Ruth and Neil had been too good to be true, and I was pretty sure this was my last day at the magic shop. Really, now? And what did Neil say about you? Well, he said... I thought about it, but couldn't remember exactly what Neil had said about me. Yes, Ruth prompted. It was something about... something about the damage being done. And you heard your name? No, not exactly, I said. I couldn't remember them saying my name, but I knew it was about me. I felt even more miserable. Was Ruth going to lie to me and tell me they weren't fighting about me? Jim, Ruth said gently, we weren't talking about you. We were talking about my grandson. Your grandson? Yes, Neil has a son, and it's complicated and sad, and I miss him. How old is he? Well, he's around your age. Where is he? He's with his mom right now, but that's not important. What's important is why you thought our argument was about you. Why you would think Neil hated you. I really didn't know what to say to that. I had just assumed they were talking about me. Jim, everyone has situations in their life that cause them pain. The situation with my grandson and my son hurts my heart. It's like a wound. Now, if I cut open my knee, what am I to do? I can give it some attention, clean it off, bandage it up, 
and make sure it heals properly. Or I can ignore it and pretend it's not there, pretend it doesn't hurt or sting, and just pull my pant leg down over it and hope it goes away. Is that the best way to heal it? No. Once again, I wasn't sure exactly what she was talking about. It's the same with the wounds in our heart, she said. We need to give them our attention so that they can heal. Otherwise, the wound continues to cause us pain. Sometimes, for a very long time. We're all going to get hurt. That's just the way it is. But here's the trick about the things that hurt us and cause us pain. They also serve an amazing purpose. When our hearts are wounded, that's when they open. We grow through pain. We grow through difficult situations. That's why you have to embrace each and every difficult thing in your life. I feel sorry for people who have no problems, who never have to go through anything difficult. They miss out on the gift. They miss out on the magic. I nodded at Ruth. I had spent a lot of my life so far comp comparing myself to my friends who seemed like they had everything. They didn't have to stand in line at the grocery store and feel the pain as the cashier looked at you when your mom handed her food stamps, or to wait in line at the government food bank for someone to give you a handout of powdered milk, butter, and a bland white block of cheese. They didn't have parents who argued, got drunk, or overdosed on pills. They didn't go to bed at night feeling like everything wrong was somehow their fault. They had cars and money and clothes and girlfriends and nice houses to live in. Ruth felt sorry for them? Jim, the next trip, trick I'm going to teach you is to open your heart. Some people have a lot of trouble with this, but for you, it's going to be easier. Why? I asked. Because life has already begun to open your heart. You care, Jim. You care for your family, your brother, your mother, and even your dad. You cared when you thought Neil was mad at you. You care enough to come here every day. And I have no doubt about your ability to care about others. That's part of opening your heart. I thought about the boy who had been getting beat up that morning. I didn't really know him, but I did care. I cared enough to stop my bike. I knew I cared because I could have been, and had been, that kid. I cared because I had felt pain and humiliation a million times already, and it hurt a lot. The other part of opening your heart, and this is where you are going to have to really practice, is caring about yourself. I cared about myself. That was going to be easy. There's a reason why you assumed our conversation was about you, Jim. You made a big leap from what you heard to Neil hitting you. I just misunderstood, I said. Yes, Ruth laughed. We all misunderstand. Each other, ourselves, situations. It's a good lesson to learn that not everything is about us. I think I need to learn that same lesson when it comes to my grandson. I nodded. Each of us chooses what is acceptable in our lives. As kids, we don't get a lot of choice. We are born into families and situations, and it's all really out of our control. But as we get older, we choose. Consciously or unconsciously, we decide how we are going to allow ourselves to be, tre to be treated. What will you accept? What won't you accept? Well, you're going to have to choose, and you're going to have to stand up for yourself. No one else can do it for you. I never got a chance to tell Ruth about the first fight I witnessed that morning, and I never heard Neil and her fight again. Every day for the next week, she taught me to open my heart. She explained to me that so often the conversation going on in all of our heads is one that is hypercritical and negative, one that frequently causes us to react in a way that is not in our best interest, one that causes us to relive events over and over or to wish for things that might be or should be. So much so that we aren't really here a lot of the time. We started that morning with Ruth having me say nice things to myself. How strange. Over and over I said repeatedly, I am good. It's not my fault. I'm a good person. It was like I was another DJ at the radio station, but everything I said was nice and comforting. Every time I caught myself listening to the other DJ, I stopped and began the kindness mantra to myself. I am worthy. I am loved. I am cared for. I care for others. I choose only good for myself. I choose only good for others. I love myself. I love others. I open my heart. My heart is open. Ruth asked me to make a playlist of these ten affirmations and repeat them every morning, every night, and just any time if it popped in my head, and especially after I did my relaxation exercise 
and tamed my thoughts. They were all kind of hokey, but I went along with it and was grateful she hadn't asked me to say them out loud. Next, she told me she wanted me to send loving thoughts to myself, my family, my friends, and even people I didn't like or who didn't deserve it. She saw me look confused when she said to send loving thoughts to those I didn't like or those who didn't deserve it. And she looked at me with a deep kindness as she said, Jim, oftentimes those who hurt people are those who hurt the most. But it was hard. It was hard to think of the bully who had beat me up and somehow think it was okay. Because it wasn't, and I still hated him, and all the other people who had been mean to me and hurt me. But I kept trying, over and over. And after a while, I found that if I thought of them being hurt, or being beat up, and crying in pain, and then what it felt like when it happened to me, it was easier. Easier when I began to realize that when I was angry with someone, it was usually because I was hurting on the inside. I was angry at myself for something, and I had never realized that before. Her words kept coming back to me. Those who hurt people are often those who hurt the most. She was right. And that was her point. If you can heal your own wounds, you don't hurt anymore, and you don't hurt others. Wow. Was being with Ruth somehow healing me? The week before, Ruth had told me that the last thing she was going to teach me was the power to get anything I wanted. I was ready to move on to that. I was getting a bit tired of talking about the heart. A lot of the time, thinking about it made me hurt. It brought up so many painful things that I'd spent a lot of time trying to bury deep down inside so they wouldn't hurt so much. But I was finding that while it really hurt when they came up, each time it was easier and not quite as painful. And finally, while I could relive the event in my mind, the emotional response wasn't quite the same. I could sit with it and not get lost in the hurt and the pain. I could sit with it and not blame myself or somehow think it was my fault. I could just be with it. And I was finding that while the DJ was still there, I just wasn't paying as much attention or the sound had gone down really, really low. Ruth was sawing my heart wide open and while it hurt at times, it also felt good. One thing every human has in common is the first sound we hear. It's the heartbeat of our mother, that steady rhythm and the first connection each of us knows, not with our minds, but the knowing is there in our hearts. The heart is where we find our comfort and our safety in the darkest of places. It is what binds us together and what breaks us when we are apart. The heart has its own kind of magic, love. When Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin first began studying compassion, it was with Tibetan monks who were long-term meditators. The monks were told they were to wear a cap on their heads, and this cap would be embedded with innumerable electroencephalogram electrodes, or EEG, to measure their compassion. And when the monks heard this, they all began laughing. The researchers thought it was because the cap looked funny with all the electrodes, each connected to a long trailing wire so that the cap resembled a wild wig. The laughter of the monks, though, wasn't because of the cap, as the scientists thought. The researchers had it all wrong. A monk finally explained what they had found so funny. Everyone knows, he said, compassion doesn't arise from the brain. It comes from the heart. Research shows the heart to be an organ of intelligence with its own profound influence, not only from our brain, but on our brain, our emotions, our reasoning, and our choices. Rather than passively waiting for instructions from the brain, the heart not only thinks for itself, but sends out signals to the rest of the body the part of the vagus nerve that arises in the brainstem and that has immense innervation in the heart and other organs is part of the autonomic nervous system, or ANS. The pattern of heart rhythms known as heart rate variability is a reflection of our inner emotional state and is influenced by the ANS. In times of stress or fear, that vagus nerve tone decreases and there is a predominance of expression of that part of the ANS called the sympathetic nervous system. He starts to get into a lot of that Uh, medical stuff, so I think that part's not quite as interesting. I'm going to skip that. Ruth was helping me form new neural connections in my brain. It was my first experience with neuroplasticity, well before the term was commonly used. In fact, although American uh, psychologist William James first presented the theory over 120 years ago, it wasn't until the latter part of the 20th century 
that it became understood that neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity was even possible. Not only was Ruth training me to change my brain by creating new neural circuits, but she was also training me to regulate the tone of my vagus nerve. The best and most skilled magicians know how to control the attention of an audience, manipulate its memories, and influence its choices without the audience having a clue that this is going on. By teaching me to relax my body and tame my thoughts, Ruth was guiding me in learning how to control my own attention. She was teaching me to perform the greatest magic trick of all time, an illusion bigger than anything Houdini could pull off, and in front of a really skeptical audience known to heckle at will. That audience was my own mind. By learning to observe my thoughts, I was learning to separate myself from them. At least, that's what Ruth told me. At the time, I was not quite sure I understood it all. Still, even with Ruth and her tricks, I couldn't see my life changing all that much. I still lived in a small apartment in a part of town that no one volunteered to live in. I was still poor. I had few friends and a social life that did not exist. And although I knew my parents loved me, my life remained dysfunctional and chaotic. At that time, it seemed that if you were born rich, you had it made. If you were born poor, you were like the sucker brought up onto the hypnotist stage who gets mesmerized into believing he's a bird. And no matter how many times he flaps his wings, people are only going to laugh and he's never going to really fly. I tried to open my heart. I tried my best to recite my affirmations, but in my mind, I was still the poor kid living in a small apartment who was often hungry for food and for love. I had a story about who I was and what my future held. I wasn't ready yet to see my wounds as gifts, but I was ready for Ruth to teach me her last trick. She had been teaching me every day for five weeks, and we only had a week left before she went back to Ohio. Jim, Ruth began, I know that some of what I've told you you don't think really has done anything. I want you to know that it has, far beyond what you can realize at this moment. I nodded and tried to interrupt her to tell her that I had done a lot, but she didn't let me speak. We don't have much time left together, Jim. In the time we have left, I'm going to teach you the greatest magic I know. But you must absolutely listen to everything I tell you. Everything. The reason this is so important is because, unlike everything else we have spent so much time on, this last thing has the power to give you everything you think you want. Unfortunately, because it can give you everything you think you want, it can be dangerous. You need to understand that what you think about and what you think you want isn't always what's best for you and others. You need to open your heart to learn what you want before you use this magic. Otherwise, if you don't really know what you want and you get what you think you want, you're going to end up getting what you don't want. Huh? Say that again? At the time, I hadn't the least understanding of what she was telling me. I only heard, it will get you anything you want. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Finally, I was ready. I knew this was going to be the magic trick that changed my life like Ruth promised. I had tried to get her to start on the last trick earlier. I kept telling her my heart was open and let's get on with it and start right away. But she always just shook her head at me. Jim, she warned, you can't skip opening your heart. It's the most important part. Trust me, promise me you'll always do this first before this last thing I'm going to show you. I know you think of what I teach you as tricks, and perhaps in some way they are magic tricks. But also, please remember, such tricks have power. If you don't take what I'm saying seriously, there will be a huge price to pay. Learn this from me now, and you won't have to learn it the hard way later. I promise. Of course, I would have promised Ruth anything to learn her last trick. Open heart or not, it didn't really matter. I always knew exactly what I wanted. Exactly. I wish I had listened more carefully. I wish I had learned at 12 to lead with a heart that's wide open to others and to the world. What pain could I have prevented? How different would my life lessons have been? What relationships might have worked out that ultimately didn't? Would I have been a better husband, a better father, a better physician? Would I have gone so brashly through the first half of my life demanding my due? What choices would I have made differently? It's hard to say. I believe we learn what we are meant to learn, and some of us are simply meant to learn things the hard way. Ruth tried to help me as best she could. She taught me to stand up for myself and to not let others determine my value, my worth, or my potential. She tried to save me from causing my own suffering. But I was young, and I was hungry, 
And when she showed me how to train my mind, she opened up the whole world to me, and I attacked it like it was the enemy. There is no way I could have known then what I know now, because if I had, I would have truly opened my heart first. The heart is powerful, but can only but it can only get us what we really want if we open it first. Experiencing pain can be a gift if one learns from the pain, but when one needlessly causes pain and suffering, not only to oneself but to others, it's neither ennobling nor fair to those who are sharing the path with you. Ruth taught me some very powerful magic, and I could have saved myself and many others a lot of pain and suffering if I had paid more attention to what Ruth was saying that day. But I was barely a teenager, and paying attention was something I had only just begun to learn. So that's that chapter. Next chapter, chapter five, three wishes. Let's see, anything going on that I need to look at in the discussions? Lots of people reacting well to what we're talking about in the story. Once we healed from our past, then only the universe will open the next doors for you, says Siraj. <laughs> Shelly says she's going to have uh, yoga with her coffee. And Shireen says, well, I did two interviews and did not get either. Moving on and holding on. Life goes on. I've been through this. <laughs> I won't say the word before. LOL. And Shelley says, what job do you really want? So I think I'll, I'll take a moment to address what Shireen said. Your attitude of, um, of K. Sarah Sarah is a good attitude. I'd recommend going one step further and doing exactly what Shelley was asking you about. Shelley was starting to ask you, what job do you really want? Um, that's because until you get really clear about what you want to do and what you get passionate about, you're going to find that it's hard to get jobs. Most often, when we're feeling desperate, we just try to get any job we can get. But because our hearts in, are not into it, we we tend to, we don't interview well when we're in that mind frame. Whereas when, if we know what we want and we know what we want to do and we, we have love for what it is that we want to do, when we go into a, a job interview, if that job is in any way related to what it is that we want to do, it comes through. The, the interviewer can tell. So... Shelley's question is a good question, Shereen. Think about what it is that you really want in detail. What what do you want to do for a job? Get very specific about it. Because the more specific you get, you're going to find it's a lot easier to get that job. So, let's see. Now she's loving the book. That's fabulous. I don't see any other questions. So let's just move on to Chapter 5, which is called Three Wishes. My summer was ending with Ruth's promise to teach me the greatest, most powerful, most secret, and life-changing magic trick of all time. I still did not understand what the trick would be, but I imagined that I would become the greatest conjurer the stage had ever seen. Most magicians made doves appear out of a scarf or rabbits from a hat or fan, of cards, uh, fan out cards out of thin air. The greatest, uh, trickiest magicians could conjure themselves, magically appearing from out of nowhere onto the middle of the stage. My summer hadn't started out with a whole lot of hope or anything to look forward to, but like a genie who comes out of a bottle and grants three wishes, Ruth was going to tell me how to conjure anything I wanted. This was the last week that Ruth would be here, and it seemed as if the six weeks had both lasted a lifetime and also gone by in a flash. Six weeks to learn four tricks seemed like a long time, but Ruth told me it often takes people years to learn and master this kind of magic and that I would have to continue to practice and make it a habit over my lifetime. While I came to the magic shop as often as I could, we would continue to practice the tricks every day until I had gotten them. Only then would, agree, would Ruth agree to move on to the next trick. I tried not to think about what I would do when she was gone or how I would spend the, remaining, the few remaining days of, of summer. Thinking about starting school left me feeling anxious. Every time I started to worry, I would practice my breathing, and relax my body. Ruth told me that worry was a waste of time, but I still felt worried about school, about my mom, about my dad, about whether we would get evicted come the 1st of September when the rent was due. Things weren't so great at home. My mom seemed to be getting more and more depressed. My dad had lost his most recent job because he went on a drinking binge and stopped showing up, and now he just sat at home smoking and watching television. He had promised me that the rent would be paid and kept telling me not to worry, but his promises didn't mean much. I was worried. 
I was worried we would be evicted. I was worried my mom might overdose. I was worried my dad would start drinking and take what little money we had left. And I was worried for my older brother, who would go to the room we shared and cry. I couldn't cry. I was the one who had to keep it together. I was the one who had to track my dad down in the bars and demand whatever money he hadn't spent. I was the one who had to ride in the ambulance when the paramedics came because my mother had attempted suicide again. I was the one who had to protect my brother from the kids who made fun of him. I walked through the door of the magic shop with a deep sigh of coming home. Neil waved to me from behind the counter. The day before as I was leaving, he told me about a secret society for magicians. You had to be invited into it, and you had to promise never to reveal your secrets to non-magicians. But, he said, I will tell you one of the most important secrets. You have to believe in your own magic. This is what makes a magician great. He believes the story he is telling to the audience. He believes in himself. It's not about the illusions or the applause or any sleight of hand. It's about the magician's ability to believe in himself and his ability to have the audience believe in him. A trick is never done at the expense of the audience. Magic isn't a hustle or a con. A real magician transports the audience to a world where anything is possible, everything is real, and the unbelievable becomes believable. I asked Neil why he was telling me this, since I certainly wasn't part of any secret magic society, at least not yet. You are going to do great magic, Jim. I know it. My mom knows it. But you have to know it. You have to really believe that's the most important thing. And that is the best secret of all magic secrets. Remember that tomorrow when you start to practice your last trick, and remember it even after my mother is gone. Ruth had lit a large candle and placed it on a small table, more like a TV tray than a table, in the middle of the back office. I had never seen this candle before. It was a tall red glass cylinder with brown and orange swirls around the outside. The candle inside was white and set about a third of the way down inside the glass so that the swirls made the flame look like it was moving and dancing. She had the lights off in the room, so it was fairly dim and seemed more mysterious than usual. "'What's that smell?' I asked Ruth. "'Sandalwood,' she said. "'Good for dreaming.' I wondered if we were going to have a seance or if Ruth was going to maybe bring out a Ouija board. I was excited and nervous like it was my first day all over again. "'Have a seat.' Ruth smiled at me and put her hand on my shoulder. She knew I had been waiting for this trick. She sat down across from me and just stared into my eyes for a few minutes. Jim, tell me what you want most out of life. Well, I didn't know what to say. I knew I wanted money, enough money so that I didn't have to worry about anything ever again. Enough money so I could buy whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. Enough money so that people would be impressed with my success and would take me seriously. Enough money so that I would be happy and my mom wouldn't be depressed and my dad wouldn't need to drink. Be as specific as possible. I was a little embarrassed to say it out loud, but I did anyway. I want a lot of money. Ruth smiled. How much money? Specifically. I had never thought about exactly how much money it would take to make all these things come true. I had no idea. Well, enough money, I said. Ruth let out a little laugh. Jim, I need you to say out loud exactly how much money is enough money. I thought about it. I had seen a man drive a silver Porsche Targa by my office, by my school often. He had, he must have worked or lived nearby. He looked so cool, and I swore one day I would have one just like that. I remembered a classmate whose father owned his own construction company and who had invited me to his house to play. It was huge, like a mansion with a large backyard and a gigantic pool and a tennis court. Well, I was going to live in a house like that someday. I remembered my friend's father lying by the pool wearing a gold Rolex watch covered in diamonds that he took off and laid on the table. He saw me looking at it and told me I could hold it. It was so heavy. He told me it was solid gold. I asked him how much it cost, not knowing it was a rude question to ask, and he didn't blink an eye and said, Six thousand dollars. That was a fortune in 1968. I couldn't imagine having that much money to spend on a watch. I told myself that one day I would have a watch just like this man had. 
I remember later watching Fantasy Island and dreaming about owning my own island. I would grant myself wishes. I wanted to have my crooked teeth fixed so people wouldn't make fun of it and wouldn't be embarrassed and I wouldn't be embarrassed by it. I wanted to go to the fancy restaurants like I saw on television. I wanted to be so rich that people would that places would be named after me. When I had all those things then I would feel okay. And that's what I wanted most of all, to be okay. A lot, I said. Enough to have everything I want. Ruth didn't even hesitate after I said this. How much is enough, she asked. I thought about saying two million dollars, but I didn't want her to think I was greedy. One million dollars, I finally said. That's enough money. <laughs> Ruth told me to close my eyes. She had me relax my body. She told me to empty my mind of thoughts. Then she told me to open my heart. I still wasn't sure about the opening the heart business, but I nodded my way through it all. Now, Jim, she said, I want you to see yourself having enough money. See the million dollars in your mind. At first, I just saw a room full of money, stacks and stacks of bills from the floor to the ceiling. Ruth asked me what I was picturing in my mind, and I told her. Jim, I don't want you to see the money. I want you to see yourself as if you have enough money. Do you know what I mean? Not really, I answered. There are two ways to picture yourself in your head. One way is as if you were watching a movie of yourself. The other way is as if you are looking out at the world through your own eyes. I want you to imagine what the world looks like to you when you have your million dollars. Try to picture the world through your millionaire eyes. Imagine you already have all the money you want. What do you see exactly? I closed my eyes and tried to imagine the future. I saw a Porsche 911 Targa. It was silver. But I couldn't picture anything through my own eyes. I could see myself driving it, but from a distance, like I was watching TV. I saw myself eating in a, fresh, in a fancy restaurant. I saw a big mansion, almost like a castle. But when I tried to look at these things as if they were mine, like Ruth said, I couldn't do it. Everything was like a movie I was watching, and even that was hard to imagine for more than a few seconds. I thought this was going to be easy, I said to Ruth, but it's hard. I told Ruth about the Porsche 911 and seeing myself in it like it was a movie. It takes practice and time and more practice, she said. Eventually you're going to be able to see the Porsche as if you were driving it. I want you to try and think about how your hands feel against the leather of the steering wheel. What does the car smell like? What does it sound like? Look down at the speedometer and tell me how fast you are going. What is the scenery outside? Is it day or night? What does your body feel like to be driving this car? I have to imagine all that? It is a lot of work, but that's the trick. You can have anything you want by visualizing that it's already yours. It's that simple and that hard all at the same time. Well, I imagined myself coming here to Lancaster this summer and I saw myself in this shop with my son. I could picture how the sun beat against the glass. I saw my hand in Neil's and I saw a young boy talking to me. I created all this in my mind and made it real long before my trip was planned. I didn't know how I was going to get to Lancaster, but I believed that I would be in Lancaster this summer in my mind I was already here. You saw me? I asked. Well, I saw myself spending time with a young boy. At the time, I thought it would be my grandson, but it didn't turn out that way. It turns out that it was you I needed to spend time with. You see, Jim, I opened my heart before I imagined the trip. I opened my heart and imagined that I would be where I was needed with someone who needed me. Then I trusted it would happen. Things don't always happen the way we think they will, but I've learned that they happen exactly the way they're supposed to happen. I don't know why I was supposed to spend this time with you, but I know there's always a reason. I know if I'm supposed to spend time with my grandson, it will happen. Jim, there is an old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. You were the one who was ready. I never really learned that much about Ruth's personal life, but 45 years after this conversation, I would learn that Ruth was able to spend the following summer, 1969, with her grandson, Curtis, in Lake Isabella, a little over 100 miles away from Lancaster. She worked her own magic. And like me, maybe it happened because now he was ready. Ruth sent me home that day and told me to practice the first three tricks she had taught me, 
to sp pay special attention to opening my heart, and then to write a list of everything I wanted to create in my life. I want you to write a list of 10 things you want. Think about what you want to create. Write down who you want to be, and then bring it with you tomorrow. I thought I got three wishes, not 10 wishes. Jim, you can have as many wishes as there are stars in the sky, but we're going to start with the 10 you bring with you tomorrow. Ruth had never given me a written homework before, but I did exactly as she said. I created my list. Number one, don't get evicted. Number two, go on a date with Chris. Number three, go to college. Number four, be a doctor. Number five, a million dollars. Number six, a Rolex, Rolex watch. Number seven, a Porsche. Number eight, a mansion. Number nine, an island. And number 10, success. I handed Ruth my list the next day. She read it through. Hmm, was her only response. What? I asked her. Jim, did you open your heart before you made this list like I asked you to? I nodded yes. It was the first and only time I ever lied to Ruth, but I wasn't quite sure how to open my heart. I didn't feel like I really understood that part of what Ruth taught me, and I was so anxious to learn how to get anything I wanted that I didn't want to ask her or to have to go backward. I only had six more days to learn how to make the things on my list come true. I didn't know you wanted to be a doctor. It was job day in the fourth grade, the day when professionals from the community come to talk about what they do for a living. We'd already had a fireman and an accountant and an insurance salesman, none of whom was of much interest to me. The fireman was pretty cool, but he said his job was mostly a lot of waiting around for something bad to happen. The next man was different. He smiled at each one of us. He was a doctor, a pediatrician, someone who only took care of children. He said, it's an honor and a privilege to care for people who are sick, especially children. It takes a very special type of person to do this job. When I was a kid, I had severe asthma and almost died. My mother took me to the doctor, and I'll never forget his smile. As soon as I saw him, I knew I wouldn't die, and at that moment, I knew I was going to be a doctor. He was glowing as he stood in front of the class and talked about his job. But it's not a job, he said. It's a calling, a calling that is not for everyone, a calling that requires those who do it to go above and beyond a regular nine-to-five job. You have to work long hours because people are depending on you, and if you fail them, it could mean they die. I looked around the room to see if anyone else was as mesmerized as I was. He must have seen me gaping at him because after his talk ended, we went to recess, and he talked up, and he walked up to me and asked me my name. Although I was a very good reader and did well in some subject, I wasn't that great a student. I didn't understand that you needed to study, and while my parents encouraged me, I didn't have a place to study or anyone to help me when I needed it. It's hard to focus when a television is blurring or an argument is in progress. My teacher seemed to focus her efforts on the brightest students or on those who were always prepared. I can't remember one time when I was asked why I was late or why my homework wasn't done. Usually the only time I would speak up was to tell jokes that often got me into trouble, and other times I just felt invisible. But for this man, I had a million questions. And unfortunately, I think we're running out of time for this episode, but we're going to be able to pick this up again tomorrow um, because Cindy is going to once again have to take uh, the morning off. So we'll see if we can at least finish this chapter and, and maybe uh, the next chapter about applying yourself and uh, I don't know if we'll get through the entire book but or the entire story anyway but uh, we're going to get as far as we can so anyway thank you for tuning in and for listening I'm seeing a lot of uh, happy uh, comments and hearts and all kinds of wonderful stuff so I think people are liking it that's great oh I love that one that comment from Amanda my gift is helping children helping children well all but children is truly a gift of mine I'm not quite sure what you meant, but Amanda, that's great. I'm glad that you, you found the gift of children. That's a terrific thing. Anyway, uh, this afternoon, of course, we'll be back with uh, both um, Alex King and new co-host Kelly, uh, Kelly Pretty, and we're going to be talking about all kinds of cool stuff and inviting questions from the audience, so feel free to join us. And In the meantime, we'll see you next time and say goodbye, and, and uh, we'll talk to you next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Mm -hmm.